we are currently in an El Nino watch. We've left El La Nina back in March and been in neutral Enzo since then. And currently, we are watching the sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific slowly warm up. Now, they've really warmed up off the coast of South America, and we are still watching that box there, which is our Nino 3.4 index box, to see how warm it gets and will it trigger an El Nino anytime soon. A large part of it's being controlled by our negative PDO. Those are the light and dark blue colors off the Alaska, North Pacific Northwest, and California coastlines. And you can see with the ocean currents, those are going to have to travel southward towards the Nino 3.4 index. And that's why we haven't seen El Nino really take off just yet. Even though we have the warmer sea surface temperatures building, they're not building uh, super fast because of that cold PDO waters. And over in the Atlantic, we've actually seen this warming up quite substantially. You can see the Gulf of Mexico off Spain, off the west coast of Africa. We have very warm waters right now that are anywhere between 2 to almost 3 degrees Celsius above the long-term average of 1991 to 2020 and that is very warm waters uh, for this time of year and it's forecasted to continue and stay pretty warm throughout the whole season and even during the peak of hurricane season the CFS American model is slightly warmer than the Canadian CANCEPS model but both are calling for above average sea surface temperatures during the peak of hurricane season then if we look at the uh, El Nino watch as we speak. Uh, if we look at the forecast coming up for the peak of hurricane season, again, both models are showing an El Nino forming, but the CFS is slightly warmer than the Canadian model once more. But the Canadian model you can see also still has that slight negative PDO in the west coast of the United States in the Pacific Ocean. So that's going to play into some of their factoring as well as we go into the models deeper into this video. Now in terms of when El Nino could kick in, because it's looking guaranteed that it's will going to happen, because we have all these warm anomalous waters below the surface, and it's just a matter of time before that breaks to the surface and we have a classified El Nino. What's going to help that is the trade winds, and you need a negative SOI that is 7 or greater for this to be considered an El Nino. And right now, uh, back in March, we first went negative then at negative 1.78, and the current 30-day average right now is negative 2.5. So we're slowly getting there, but we uh, st were back in January at 11 on the positive side. So it's going to take some time, and especially with those negative uh, PDO numbers out in the Pacific, it's going to take some time for this to get to El Nino. And when we are looking at positive numbers, we have stronger trade winds that pushes the warmer waters back towards Asia and Australia. And we have cooler waters uh, normally in the equatorial Pacific. It's when we have the negative SOI number, the trade winds, are weaker or even have westerly winds coming from Australia and blowing towards South America that we have El Nino winds uh, warming up the ocean temperatures and bringing up that pocket of warm waters below the surface to the surface. And we don't see that happening anytime soon uh, until maybe the middle of May. As you can see here on our graph, our black boxes are uh, Nino region, uh, Ninos 3 and 4, and it's not until about May 16th do we see these yellow and red shades. That's indicating weaker trade winds, even westerly winds, uh, kicking in. Between now and then, we're going to have stronger trade winds with these blues and greens showing the anomalously stronger trade winds. So we could actually see those numbers dip and uh, we and El Nino taking even longer to set in because more upwelling will occur, bringing colder waters from below. But even if that does happen and it delays it just a little bit, the models are still projecting by the time we get to 
peak hurricane season, we will be in a El Nino, possibly a moderate El Nino. And we have a greater than 80% chance of that happening. So during the peak hurricane season, when El Nino is in place, the Eastern Pacific usually has the rising motion where, and we have sinking air in the Atlantic. And that creates fewer hurricanes we have stronger vertical wind shear and more stability in the atmosphere because we're not get instability would be the rising air when you have stable air you have sinking air so if we look at the models the on the left is the american cfs model again and on the right is the canadian model you can see that this is the 200 millibar level where the jet stream flies these reds are indicating stronger jet stream winds. And basically where the stronger winds are, we're gonna have more wind shear occurring, which you can see here across the Gulf of Mexico on the American model as, as well as the Canadian model. But in between, in that subtropical Atlantic, just north of the Caribbean islands, we actually have anomalously uh, less wind shear, which would be very conducive for tropical development. Now the Canadian model, is not showing as a favorable environment uh, it's showing more influence from the el nino the american model is showing more influence from the warmer sea surface temperatures in the atlantic countering counteracting that el nino that's trying to establish itself so if we look at the precipitation anomalies you can see a lot more rain potentially falling just north of the main development region in the subtropical atlantic and with that less wind shear would be conducive for tropical development. Canadian model has not as much of those green colors, meaning those yellows are indicating less precipitation than normal. And that would be an indicative of a more stable environment, more sinking air. Now, if we go to the second half of the hurricane season, we see that these trade winds are lacking a little bit on the American model and as well as on the Canadian model, which is we have some an agreement there. So if we look at the wind shear anomalies, we can see that we have a lot more uh, wind shear favorability in terms of less wind shear in, on the American model through the main development region and the Caribbean. And we have it less favorable in the Gulf of Mexico and the subtropical Atlantic, meaning El Nino at that point will be taking effect and making a stronger subtropical jet move through the southern half of the, of the United States. And you can see that on the Canadian model as well, but it's a little bit further north. So there's a pocket of favorable wind shear in the subtropical Atlantic on the Canadian model versus the Caribbean. So both the, Car the American model would suggest we would have an active main development region and Caribbean activity the second half of the season. Whereas, on, and you can see that here with our precipitation anomalies, but the Canadian model is still not showing a lot of precipitation. So that not sure, quite sure what it's trying to show there. So, but the American model is also still being influenced by that much warmer Atlantic Ocean uh, the Canadian model was showing a warmer Atlantic, but not as much as the American. So I think that's what's influencing the American model much more. If we look at the peak of hurricane self, which is August, September, October, we see not a lot of uh, upper level winds on the American model. The Western Caribbean and the Gulf, there is a lot of there. So that's why we see more wind shear on the Canadian model 